Well, hello, this is Mike from Music City. Welcome to my latest installment of Ranking Records. Today, we're looking at a year, and the year is 1985. Uh, as you know, I've been going in both directions. I think the last one I did was 75. Now we go to the other end of the coin, and we're on uh, 85. And man, I think I'm going to ruffle some feathers this year. Uh, with this year, because I'm a little going to be a little bit of a contrarian. I think there's a few albums that uh, a lot of you uh, may have on your list that are not going to be on mine, and I'll kind of tell you why. Maybe I'll start off with the three. And hey, I don't uh, dislike either one of these records that I'm going to talk about here now, but uh, they hey, they just don't make my top ten. And and I think uh, again, you know, I'm not coming this from a critical perspective. I'm coming from what I liked, what were my favorites. And I, I I don't like to revise history very much. I do sometimes on occasion, but this is a good example of 10 records that I've listened to a lot in 1985 and enjoyed. Okay, now, if we go to the uh, Village Voice Paz and Jop poll, which is usually the first place I look, number one and number two off the Paz and Jop that year are not going to be in my top 10. And number one was Talking Heads, Little Creatures. And number two was Tim by The Replacements. Now, I, I like both records. Now, let me come right off that. I'm not a huge Talking Heads fan. I liked them. Um, didn't listen to that record enough for it to be up here. And I'm a huge Replacements fan. And I'm going to be honest with you, in 1985, I wasn't listening to The Replacements. It took me a little while to catch on. And when I look back, I like Tim, but Tim is, you know, and I've ranked their, their records separately. Tim's not high on my list of, of Matt's albums, and that's probably why... Uh, it's not going to be in this top 10. And um, um, the other record I feel like I want to mention is a very uh, successful record, and it could have been one of the best-selling records in 1985, and that was Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms. I like the record, and again, I like with the hits. I'm not a huge Dire Straits fan. Um, you know, I even went and saw them play that year uh, in, when I lived in San Antonio, and it was kind of interesting because, you know, I got to see a guy from Rockpile, Terry Williams, was was, was playing drums for the band uh, band then. And and I'll never forget about that show. I, they did something I don't think I ever saw a band do, and I meant to look up and see if I could find what song it was. I don't remember, but they opened up and did a 30-minute song as the opening song. I thought that was just very, very, very unusual. But, you know, Knopfler always liked to play more, on, you know, very, was, 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 was intent on, you know, on the musical side of things and no, no, nothing wrong with that but I thought that was a little odd uh choice there now um so let's let's look at my 10 and uh you, you know I think what's interesting if you've been following my series you know there's a lot of my old favorites that keep popping up every year but there was no Bruce Springsteen record here this year and there was no Elvis Costello record this year so they they don't get uh uh those artists don't get to make it but you will see two of my my all-time favorite artists right here and as a matter of fact we're going to start off with one of them and at number 10 uh, it's going to be The Rose of England by Nick Lowe. And and one of the interesting things about today, we're going to see uh, UK versus US releases on, on a number of these. And this one was identical, but had two different covers. Here's the US uh, cover, and here's and here's the British cover. I, I think this was a great, great record by Nick. Um, and I, I kind of thought about ranking it higher. Uh, you know, I think the title track, Rose of England, is one of the best songs Nick has ever ever written. And a matter of fact, I got to tell him that one time. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful ballad, uh, well written, well sung. Uh, man, I think it's something today somebody in, somebody in Americana should cover it. I actually, uh, when I when I talked to Nick about it, I had just seen this band in New York, played in New York, a British band called the uh, Oyster Band, kind of a folky kind of band. And they did a great version of it. It was at the old Lone Star Cafe in New York. So he was interested in hearing that. But Great song. Uh, also on this record was the first time we heard uh, Indoor Fireworks, an Elvis Costello song that Elvis would, would do a year later on the King of America record. Um, and it's also very interesting on here. You've got a version of Nick's Old I Knew the Bride when she used to rock and roll uh, that Edmonds, he gave to Edmonds first to do. And on this version, he's back, not by his great cowboy outfit. Uh, cowboy outfit, of course, Bob Irwin, Paul Carrick, and Martin Belmont, along with Nick. Uh, but he recorded it with Huey Lewis and the News. You know, Huey was an old friend from back in the pub rock days when uh, the, the, those guys uh, in the band called Clover came over to England to hang out. So, number 10, Nick Lowe, Rose of England. Now, uh, thinking back again, 1985, I remember you know, living in San Antonio and there was a new radio station that came on and they weren't playing the heavy metal stuff that was most popular in uh, San Antonio back then. They weren't playing, uh, you know, current 
what I call album oriented rock. They were really getting deep into some new stuff and I wish I could remember the name of that station, but it was really good. And the next two albums were records uh, that I definitely discovered from listening to that station, which I just can't remember the name of it. Maybe you can help me. And I uh, actually got to see both of these artists and, and, and strange enough, both of them are female singers, so female artists. Uh, the first one's not so much of a writer, but we're going to go at number nine is Marty Jones, Unsophisticated Time. And, you know, I, I posted this on Facebook uh, just last week when I thought of this album. I do. I post an album every day and people comment on it. And I could not believe the love a lot of the Nashville musicians had for this record. So I maybe kind of justified and felt good picking this one. But Marty, as you may know, uh, is married to Don Dixon, uh, you know, the noted producer and artist. And uh, he, Don produced this record. And Marty uh, isn't a songwriter much per se. I don't think she wrote anything on this record. And she just covers a lot of great stuff. You know, a lot of Dixon songs, a lot of Dixon's friends. There's some Peter Hulse Happel songs on here. She does... Uh, What's the uh, uh, Lonely Is His Only Does, which was a DB song, uh, Hulse Apples Band. Uh, she does a Elvis Costello song, The Element Within Her, which, oh God, I'm getting fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure that was Punch the Clock. And uh, I got to see Marty uh, at the bottom line when this album came in in New York and her and Don played. And uh, it was really neat to hear her do Element with, Within Her. And uh, she made a comment about Elvis Costello. She said something like, and this is back when I did my Elvis Costello fanzine, so I was always hungry for words that people said anything, anything any, I heard anybody say about Costello, I had to put in my magazine. I mean, if I remember correctly, she said something. She was real excited to meet him, and she was so nervous. She said, uh, you're my biggest fan. So she kind of twisted her words around. But the real, real centerpiece off this record is this great song. And I, for, for some reason, uh, I thought Marty wrote it, but she didn't. Somebody named B. Simpson wrote it, and I didn't get a chance to look and see who that was. But this really great song called Follow You All Over the World, and that's the one they played a lot on the radio. But great, Marty's such a great singer. She's a really nice person. I got to meet her a couple of times. So here's a good record to check out. Now, the other uh, number eight spot is another uh, female songwriter whose debut record came out in that year. She and she was a songwriter, still is a songwriter, and that's the debut album by the great Suzanne Vega. And, of course, the, the big hit off of this record, the big song that got a lot of play was Marlena Off the Wall. Such a, such a really great, great song. Uh, I, I just in, really enjoy her writing. And, as you know, it was her follow-up album where she came out with the song Luca that she sort of really skyrocketed, but there, there's a... A lot of good songs in this record. I, I I saw her in San Antonio at a small theater called the Cameo Theater. We sat in the front row, and it, it was a fantastic show. And I guess I saw her right before COVID uh, here in, in Nashville, and she's still great. So that's my number eight, Suzanne Vega, in a very, very fine debut record. Now, number seven. Okay, one of my fave bands comes back in, and uh, they had disappeared for a while. They uh, had broken up. Uh, and well, we're talking about Squeeze. They'd broken up, different, and Tilbrook got together, did a solo record, and they got back together in 85, and they did Cozy Van Tutti Fruity. Hey, you can see the poster back there. I forgot all about that. Um, and um, it was it was, a, a, was interesting. What was, what was special for the band, Jules Holland, you know, rejoined them after, you know, Paul Carrick uh, and Don Snow had been the keyboard players. And also we had a new bass player, Keithy Wilkerson, who had, was in the different and Tilbrook band, uh, had joined them, and and it's, and it's a fine record. A lot of songs that you know still last into the squeeze set this day. Uh, to this day, you know my favorite uh, were, were King George Street, uh, Hits of the Year, and Last Time Forever. Uh, produced by Lori Latham, it was a little different sound for Squeeze, but not too different. And I, I don't know if I put my finger on it. Maybe more, little little more orchestrated, uh, but still the great songwriting of Chris and the great singing of Glenn and uh, number seven, Cozy Van Tutti Fruity. And I guess there's the clever way of getting the cozy, T Cozy fan and Tutti Fruity, okay. And that's a takeoff on, um, is it Mozart? <laughs> All right, number six, there's always a Costello connection. And I guess, oh God, I'm a little fuzzy, but probably maybe the first LP he produced, Rum Sodomy and Lash um, by the Pogues. Uh, and he not only produced the record, he stole the bass player and <laughs> and, uh, and uh, started his long uh, romance with uh, Cotto Reardon. Uh, and uh, just a, such a fine record. Elvis did a great job producing it. I believe this is the, s the second... Mm, God, I'm getting fuzzy. I hate when I forget things, but I think it's the second Pogue. Maybe the second Pogue's record. Um, Dirty Old Town, uh, Sally McElaine. Uh, what's the other one I wanted to mention? Um... 
<laughs> Pair of Brown Eyes. Oh, God, what a wonderful song. Uh, but great record. Uh, you saw them in this tour, and God, you know, uh, Shane McGowan, it's a miracle. He's still with us, and uh, he's such a mess, and, you know, probably didn't understand a single word that he sang all night in, in his uh, slurred uh, Irish uh Act, slurred vocals with his Irish accent, but I still love him. Uh, great, great record. If you don't have this one, check it out. Uh, I, I kind of liked one of their later records better, uh, but I think this was a fine, fine record at the time, number six. Now, number five, um, you know, I had kind of forgotten about this record, but when I when I started going into it, I realized how much I really like this record. Now, I am not, I'm a Prince, Prince fan. I'm not a huge Prince fan. And I feel like the reason I'm not is I don't have enough time to invest in all the Prince music that's out there. So I've been fairly selective in what I've listened to. But Around the World in the Day came out in 85. And I think uh, not only is this one of the neatest album covers of all time, uh, it's such a solid record. And it's got my probably got my two favorite Prince songs of all time on there, uh, Raspberry Beret and Pop Life. And, and at the time in 86 to Elvis Costello, always the Elvis connection, he, did pop, he was doing Pop Life. Uh, in uh, in his in his live set for a while, but just such a such a great record. Uh, and I think I don't follow all the Prince stuff, but I think the box set just came out on this one, didn't it? If help me if I'm if I'm wrong on that, but um, a great record. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to leave this one out and listen to it. I hadn't heard it in a while, but number five was definite for me. Was Prince. Now we get uh, number four. Now this this was really exciting, and I remember the excitement of this record coming out. And knowing that MTV was going to do a premiere video for the song, and I was waiting for it. And uh, it happened to be a pretty lame video, but it was a great song. And that was a very, very derivative from his old band, John Fogarty, doing Old Man Down the Road from his record Centerfield, which was a fantastic record. And this, I was surprised to see this did score pretty high on the Paz and Jop poll that year. And come on, the title track... What an iconic song that's become, and you know I'm a huge baseball fan, and it's so great to hear, uh, uh, you know how how this um, how this you know record has has come into prominence. That song has come into prominence every baseball season, and uh, you know I did get to oh I got a long story to tell you about me and John Fogerty, but I did meet John Fogerty uh, one time I was in West Hollywood, and he and he was staying at uh, a hotel I was at, and uh, I, I saw him check in, and I I got the courage to ask the bellhop what room he was in and and I knocked on the door and he he was so kind to answer it and he was there watching a baseball game and asked him for an autograph and as I leave he said hey what are you doing <laughs> and we proceeded to spend a couple hours together uh down in the hotel bar and just had a great time one of the nicest people I've ever met and that in no way influences what a great great record this is uh John Fogarty Centerfield coming in number four uh, it was a long time before I saw Fogarty in concert, and I got to see him a couple of times, and, and he and he is great. He still is great. I hope to get to see him again sometime soon. Number three, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, this is an important record, uh, very important record that year, and I think it's underestimated, undervalued, uh, and that's Lost and Found by Jason, and I think at the time where they called, yep. I've seen it called Jason and the Nashville Scorchers. The record says Jason and the Scorchers. So I got this one autographed, got to see him play a club in San Antonio around this. And like I said, an important record in, I guess we called it Cow Punk. Remember, we, we talked, you've heard me talk maybe about another band I loved at this time called Rank and File. But, you know, kind of really led into, you know, the whole country rock reinsurgence that, you know, somewhat Americana. Americana may, may be a little more singer-songwriter oriented, but man, this stuff was great back then. A lot of energy, you know, was, we were still in the throes of, of punk and new wave, and, and this was just really, really a very fresh spot of the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the musical spectrum. Jason Ringenberg, one of the other, again, one of the other nicest guys I've ever met in music, lives here in town, see him, you know, uh, play uh, on often occasion, great guitar player, uh, Warner Hodges, um, sadly the drummer Perry ba Perry Bang it's Perry Bangs, right? I, I don't want I don't want to. Yeah, Perry no Perry Bags. I'm, I'm sorry. You know he passed away. Uh, I think it was last year, and uh, kind of sad. But uh, great record. Uh, got White Lies on it. Broken Whiskey Lask. Lost Highway. Oh uh, man, Jason tours and plays around. Go see him. He's great. I know the Scorchers uh, probably they're probably still huge over in over in Europe. Uh, definitely deserves a high spot, and glad again, glad to see this one do high on Paz and Job. All right, now 
the Anglophile in me is going to come out with it with the top two here, and we're going to look at records that um, came out a little different in the U.S. and U.K. Not in um, in uh, not in track selection. The track selections are identical. Uh, the covers of one are different, and the, the but the titles of both albums are different. Now, isn't that kind of strange? And the first one you saw, you may have seen my jam ranking, and I talked about my love for the Style Council. Uh, our favorite shop by the Style Council uh, was the UK version of the record, and when it came out over here, they called it Internationalist, and they took their picture that was on the ins mm, not the exact, the kind of a, a version of that picture that was on the. Uh, inside cover here for the U.S. Um, man, I love the Style Council, and you know we talked about it on the on the on the Jam video. You know near the late, late ending days of the Jam, you know you can hear the sort of the Style Council direction a little bit in Weller's music. Uh, you know, and he, but when he hooked up with McTal, but uh, you know it went full steam ahead. Horns, soul, you know more more big band arrangements, and just just some really really great stuff. Uh, the songs are fantastic. The arrangements are incredible, and Weller just sings great. Talbot plays great. Um, my favorite song, my favorite song of this record is a song called "Luck," and if I've got it somewhere here, um, you know, at the time uh, Weller, I believe he was married to the backup singer DC Lee. Uh, if they weren't married, and they were dating, whatever, and uh, there was a B side where DC sang the lead vocal on a version of "Luck," and it was fantastic. I loved it. Uh, I want to pull that one out and listen to you, but uh, Waltz came tumbling down, Waltz come tumbling down, uh, with everything to lose, the lodger, oh gosh, just uh, song after song, great stuff, uh, Style Council. On that list of bands that I am so sad I never got to see, uh, I don't know that I'll ever get to see him again, and I've never get to see Weller, and I know that he does a few Style Council songs, I would love it. And the other thing, I can't wait, I just heard they've come out with a special uh, on the Style Council, a documentary. It's on Showtime. I don't have Showtime, so uh, I'm either going to make the plunge or hopefully, hopefully, it'll come out on Blu-ray with some good bonus stuff. So I'm going to kind of watch out for that. Uh, that's what I hear may very well happen. But number two. Now, number one. Are you wondering? Are you thinking? All right, now, I know this band is an acquired taste, but they are one of my favorite bands of all time. And again, Fall in that category of bad bands I've so sad I've never seen. And I, to my knowledge, I do not believe this band has ever played in America. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever get to see him. The lead singer uh, has some health issues. Uh, he has eyesight issues and doesn't, uh, I don't think he, I don't think he'll ever play again because of that. But that is the fantastic uh, Patty McAloon and his band Prefab Sprout. Now the record came out in the UK under the name Steve McQueen. Uh, I guess the estate of Steve McQueen didn't like that, but I don't understand how they didn't have to change it in England. They kept the title there. But over here, they changed it to Two Wheels Good. I guess that's kind of a takeoff on the on the Animal Farm thing. Isn't there four, in the book Animal Farm, George Orwell, and four legs good, two legs bad, something like that. And I guess the two wheels being the motorcycle we see pictured on the cover. But just a great record produced uh, by all people, by Thomas Dolby, uh, who really didn't produce a lot of people, but I think Dolby did a great job with this record. Uh, you know, back that radio station I talked to uh, back then in San Antonio played uh, the song When Love Breaks Down, which had an MTV video that got a lot of play. Um, I first discovered um, Prefab Spell. This is their second album. Their first album was called Swoon. And I heard him because on, on Elvis Costello's solo tour in 1984, he was doing Prefab Sprout's uh, Cruel would come in that first record and kind of led me into discovering this band. And like I said, I've got everything they've ever done and just I'm a huge fan of Prefab Sprout. I'm sure I'll be doing a video on them alone at some point in time. But uh, the song Farron Young, um, uh, Moving the River. My favorite song on this record, though, is Appetite. Uh, check it out if you haven't. Uh, if you take, then put back good. If you steal, be Robin Hood. But if your eyes aren't one and all they see, I think I'll name you after me. I think I'll call you Appetite. I always love that verse. But again, there's my number one. Uh, I know a lot of people think Patty McAloon's lyrics can be weird and obscure and silly, but that's I think that's part of his charm. Uh, but he's such a great singer, such a great arranger, and there's just so many great 
Prefab Sprout songs, and I, I think you'll probably see Prefab Sprout in, in some future list as we get out into the future a little bit. But hey, that was kind of fun. It wasn't as easy a year to put together as some of my other ones, but I think it was a lot of fun. I hope you find it interesting. I'd like to hear what, what you think. I'm sure a lot of people are going to mention the three I had in my honorable mention. But again, hey, thanks for your support. Um, please hit the subscribe button. It doesn't cost a thing and it helps me get closer to a thousand. I think I'm at like 779 or something like that, 789. Uh, doing well. We're getting, you know, we're getting every week we keep adding on. Um, I've got all kinds of other stuff out there. You can watch me shop for records. You can watch me talk about great forgotten records. Uh, we rank, I rank records by artists, rank records by year, uh, do some unboxing stuff. And also, if you follow me, you'll notice that every day I have, I, I've got a huge collection and access to a lot of television videos, you know, bands on late night talk shows. I post something different every single day and that you get in your subscribe box, you'll be able to see what I do and you can check out some good stuff there. So, hey, Mike from Music City saying thank you, stay safe, be happy, and uh, we'll see you again soon.